believers. Philippians. Um, I, I'm going to read a couple words from the end of chapter 1, and then I'll meet you in chapter 2, verse 1. We're gonna, let's talk about a call to unity. Paul says in Philippians 1.27, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Now look in chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and has given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Father, I pray we'd encounter you while we receive your word this morning. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen. Well, I'm wondering if anybody here has ever been personally reprimanded from the pulpit during church. I have. I came to faith in Christ when I was eight years old, along with my mom and my middle sister. And I always loved going to church, but back in those days, church was very, very long. We went to Sunday school for an hour, and then morning service was about two and a half hours, and then we went back at night for a couple of hours. On one particular Sunday morning, I was getting a little hangry. You know what hangry is, right? It's when you get hungry, you're angry. So I started begging my mom during the sermon to take us out for lunch after church. I was whining, I was pulling on her arm, and my mom was trying to wave me away when all of a sudden I heard my name. And I looked up and my pastor was looking right at me. He said, Brother Glenn, sit still and leave your mother alone. Yikes. You know, it wasn't really so much the laughter of 800 people that worried me. It was that every cell in my mother's body froze in that moment. She never flinched. Her expression didn't even change a flicker, but I knew I had had it. Not only did we not go out for lunch, I didn't sit down to eat lunch for the next couple of days. It's pretty bad when the pastor calls you out at church. At the end of Philippians, Pastor Paul calls out two ladies in the Philippian church, Iodia and Syntyche. Someone called them odious and so touchy. Uh, apparently these two sisters were in some kind of quarrel, and their quarrel was threatening to damage the whole Philippian church. So it's at the end of Philippians that we learn what the whole book is really about. It's about unity. You know, sometimes people hide spare keys near their front door, and sometimes people hide spare keys near the back door. The key to unlocking Philippians is hidden in the back of the book in chapter 4. You remember with me that Paul is writing this letter from prison in Rome. 
When the Philippians heard about Paul's chains, they dispatched Epaphroditus to carry a love offering to him and to stay there and serve Paul whatever way he could. So Paul is writing this letter, first of all, to say thank you. But while Epaphroditus was visiting, he told Paul about the quarrel between these two ladies. So Paul addresses the issue of unity, beginning here with this call to unity. Looking at Paul's words, I find three parts to this call to unity. I want to share about them with you very quickly this morning. A call to unity, three parts in Philippians 2. First of all, looking at Paul's words, I find the basis of our unity. The basis of our unity. Beloved, I want you to know that whatever happens in this world, the church of Jesus Christ will survive all the way to the end until Jesus comes again. You see, I've read all the way to the end of the book. And at the end of the book, when everything else is gone, there's Jesus and his bride, the church, saying, come. In the history of the world, the only other entity that has survived and adapted and persisted like the church is the Jewish people. And in the end, God will make us one. But the church has outlasted every world empire and emperor. The church has outlasted every kind of government and social movement. It has outlasted generation after generation of people. The church has adapted to every cultural shift brought on by science and technology and industry and communications. The church has outlasted feudalism, colonialism, fascism, socialism, communism, and if Jesus tarries, it will outlast American exceptionalism. You see, yesterday's isms are tomorrow's wasms, but the church will endure. The church has outlasted rationalism, Darwinism, naturalism, skepticism, and modernism, and it will outlast postmodernism. It will outlast this generation called the millennials, but not before it first embraces them, and they will carry the church further than we ever dreamed of doing. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will never stop it from advancing. Now, that doesn't mean that the church will always look the same as it does today. That doesn't mean that we'll always do things the same old way. But the church will endure to the end and it will triumph in the end. And these first few verses of Philippians 2 show us why. It is because we are held together by a shared supernatural experience. Beloved, I want to tell you that the church is absolutely unique in all of the world. We are unlike any other group. We are unlike any other club or organization or institution. We are unlike any other religious community. Yes, we have shared values and ideals, but that is not what ultimately holds us together. Yes, we have shared interests and goals, but that's not what holds us together. Yes, we have shared bonds of friendship, but that alone is not what holds us together. What holds us together is something supernatural. Rapid fire. Paul lists four supernatural experiences that we hold in common and that hold us together. First, Paul says that we share an experience of supernatural strength. Paul makes four rhetorical if statements. And in each, in each case, if actually means since. If you have received encouragement by being in Christ means since you have received encouragement by being in Christ. But what does Paul mean exactly by that? Well, there's a, a defining moment of believing on Jesus. There's a moment when the gift of faith from God enters into our heart. You know, although you might not understand it all, 
Although you might still have lots of questions, I've been walking with the Lord for 42 years. I've been studying the scripture for, for formally and informally for all that time. I still have questions. But somehow deep inside of you, in the deepest place, you know that you know that you believe in Jesus. In that moment of faith, something supernatural happens inside of us. We become united with Christ. In fact, we become united with him so intimately that in a way that I can't even really fully explain to you, his experiences on the cross and in the grave and in the resurrection somehow become our experience too. In that moment of believing, the Bible says we are co-crucified with Christ. We are co-buried with Christ and we are co-resurrected with him. We die to our old former way of living. Our old sinful nature is buried for good and we arise to a whole new way of living as a new creation in Christ. In that moment of faith, we leave our old spiritual state that the Bible calls in Adam and we begin a new existence called in Christ. And one of the things that happens to us is that we receive a new supernatural strength inside of us. Paul calls it here encouragement. It means that we receive a powerful strengthening of our inner being. The resurrection power of Christ comes into the very core of our person and he gives us a, a sense of inner significance and inner security. He gives us a whole and a healthy sense of personhood. The Bible says we now walk in newness of life. We have an identity of confidence, not rooted in ourselves, but rooted in Christ. We feel like a winner, and we are in him. We have courage to face each new day and each new season in our life. We don't tremble in fear about what the future might hold, about what might happen. We don't fear even death itself. We feel capable to handle whatever it is that comes our way. Again, not relying on ourselves, but because we are empowered from within by him. Four supernatural experiences that we hold in common and that hold us together. Strength and a second is we share an experience of supernatural love. If you have received encouragement in Christ, remember, if means since, and if you have received any comfort from his love. In that moment of believing, we are not only united with Christ, but we are also reunited with the Father. You see, all of us are born into an estranged relationship from our Heavenly Father. We're born separated from his love by our sinful condition. Now, God never stops loving us, but we can't experience his love. We can't receive it. We, we can't reciprocate it. I like to say it this way. God never stops transmitting, but we're born with a broken receiver. But in that moment of believing, our sins and the punishment that they deserve are removed from us. They're placed on Jesus, on the cross. The Bible says they're taken away. The barrier is removed and our, trans our receiver is fixed. In that moment, the love of God comes cascading down on us. He lavishly, the Bible says, pours his love into our hearts. And his love heals us in every possible way and makes us whole people. Paul says we receive comfort from his love. Feelings of worthlessness are erased and they're replaced by an abiding sense of significance. Abandonment and rejection are replaced by the Father's affirmation and acceptance. Neglect is replaced with an assurance of the Father's attentiveness. You know, when I was, when, when Lolly was just a little girl, just two, three years old, she would climb up on my lap, and if I was reading something or watching something on television and she wanted my attention, she would grab my chin and she would turn my face to, to look at her. 
Aren't you so thankful that we never have to grab the Father's chin and, and turn his face? His gaze is always fixed upon us, and we have an assurance of that inside of us. Drivenness to perform is replaced with confidence in the Father's good pleasure in you, just as he made you. Four supernatural experiences that we hold in common and that hold us together. Strength, love, and third, we share an experience of supernatural bonding. If you have received any encouragement in Christ, and you have, and if you have received any comfort from his love, and you have, and if you have a sharing in the Spirit. You see, in that moment of believing, the Holy Spirit invades our heart and he creates a sense of belonging. First of all, belonging to our Father and then belonging to one another. The Holy Spirit makes us feel like family. In fact, isn't it amazing how sometimes you feel more like family with your Christian brothers and sisters than your own family? I, I know, you know, every year around Thanksgiving time and Christmas time, there are people dreading, got to go see my family. I'd rather stay with my family in Christ. You see, that's what makes the church unlike anything else on earth. That's why the church will never be extinguished. That's why it cannot be stopped. Persecuted, you bet. Held back, scattered for a little bit, but snuffed out, absolutely never. We are held together by the supernatural super glue of the Holy Spirit. We are stuck together. The Bible says in that moment of believing, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. We are now members of one body. You know, if I decide that I don't really want to be associated with my arm anymore, it would take some pretty radical and painful action to disassociate myself from my arm. It's pretty firmly attached. And that's precisely how much we are attached to one another by the Holy Spirit. Four supernatural experiences that we hold in common and that hold us together. Strength, love, bonding. And the fourth, we share an experience of supernatural affection and compassion. If you have received encouragement in Christ, and if you have received comfort from his love, and if you have sharing in the spirit, and if you have affection and compassion. The love that we receive from the Father the inner strength we receive from the Son, the bonding that we receive from the Spirit, it results in an atmosphere among us of supernatural affection and compassion. Do you know there's something palpable to that? I feel it often when we're gathered together. You know, I, I look around and I look at you and, and my heart just overflows with so much affection, with so much appreciation. I want God's very best for you. I want you to be well in every possible way. I want you to experience all the beauty of the Lord and all of his free-flowing blessings. And other, others feel it too, even non-believers who come in among us, that they feel it, they, they feel there's something here. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 28, that, that this sense of togetherness is a sign, even to unbelievers, that we have something here, that God is with us, that salvation is here. The Father's love, the Son's strength, the Spirit's bonding, leading to mutual affection and compassion. This is the basis of our Christian unity and the reason that though we may be fiercely opposed in the world, the church of Jesus Christ will never be defeated. I'm preaching a little better than you're listening this morning. I just want to tell you. A call to unity. Three parts in Philippians 2. Number one, the basis of our unity. Second, I find in Paul's words, the basics of our unity, the basics of our unity. The, the, the four supernatural experiences that we share, that's God's part in our unity, but we have a role to play as well. Paul says, if God has done these four things for you, and he has, then here is how you must respond. It is absolutely true that nothing on earth can stop the church, but 
local churches can be destroyed, and they are by quarreling Christians. Paul warns the Galatians, don't bite and devour one another, or there will be nothing left. From the United Kingdom comes the story of a local church that was in search for a new pastor. Somehow the congregation became divided into two camps, each determined that they would be the one to select the new pastor. On one particular Sunday, both camps invited a different pastor to come and lead the worship service. Two pastors showed up. Two pastors got up at 10 a.m. to start the worship service. They called out two different hymns. This is a true story. The congregation sang two different hymns at the same time. Two pastors read two different Bible passages and then started to preach two different sermons shouting over each other to be heard. The next morning, this happened in Wales, the, the headline in the local paper read, Hallelujah, two jacks in the pulpit. <laughs> Unity in the church is the unique supernatural work of God, but we do have a role to play. Unity depends on you. Unity depends on your mindset. Paul mentions our minds three times in these verses. Make my joy complete by being like-minded. Be of one mind. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Do you ever stop to wonder what the mind of Jesus was like? Well, how did the mind of Jesus work? What were his thought processes like? I mean, after all, he was 100% God and 100% man. So did Jesus have to learn things? When the teacher got up and taught something in school, did Jesus say, Psh, I already knew that? <laughs> did Jesus have to figure things out? What subjects interested Jesus? What occupied his thoughts? Philippians 2 answers some questions, not all of them. But it does tell us especially about the character of Jesus' mind. And what should be the character of our mind as well. If you look at Philippians 2 verse 2, Paul says, Be like-minded, be of one mind. And sandwiched in between that use of the word mind are, the, are two elaborations that show us what was the character of Jesus' mind and what should be the character of our mind. First of all, let your mind be controlled by love. Paul says, be like-minded, having the same love. You know, that was the secret to Jesus' thought life. His mind was thoroughly saturated by God's love. So in every situation, Jesus was always thinking about the most perfectly loving thing to do. Often it was to extend mercy to those who deserved none. Sometimes it was to rebuke those who refused to be merciful. Sometimes Jesus corrected. Sometimes Jesus sternly warned. Sometimes Jesus affirmed and encouraged. Sometimes he was just silent. But in every instance, Jesus did the most loving thing he could possibly do. We might look at that and say, well, that was easy for him. He was Jesus. But Paul has already told us that by faith, we are united with Jesus, and now we're just as saturated with the love of God as he was. Now we need to let his love be our mental filter every day. Somebody asked Jesus one day, Lord, what's the most important commandment? You remember Jesus' answer, right? The most important commandment is love. The Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength so what would happen if we started each day praying lord let your love be my mental filter today every interaction i have with people today and the thoughts i think about it afterwards let your love be the filter every decision i make today let your love be my filter the things my mind dwells on today let your love be my filter. And when we come to church, what have we prayed? Lord, let your love be my mental filter today. When they sing that song I don't like, let your love be my filter. 
When the sermon is too long, when the jokes are lame, let your love be my filter. When the AC is too cold, when the sound is too loud, when the amens are too much, when the person parks too close next to me, <laughs> let your love, apparently that resonates. I got a big amen in 8.30 from somebody on that one. Let your love, listen, I don't mind if you want to park sideways across two spaces, you know, do it. But just go way out in the back now, all right? And, and park your car over two spaces in the back. Don't bother anybody else. Let your love be my filter. What was the character of Jesus' mind? Controlled by love and let your mind be guided by the Holy Spirit. Be like-minded, having the same love and being one in the Spirit. Jesus revealed the secret of his ministry. He said, I only do what I see my father doing and I only say what I hear my father saying. In other words, Jesus' mind was constantly guided by the Holy Spirit and ours can be too. The Holy Spirit enables us to see people as God sees them. Holy Spirit enables us to know how God wants to minister, how God wants to help, how God wants to touch someone, how God wants to meet someone's need in any given moment. Can you imagine what church would be like if we all came together with our minds controlled by love and guided by the Holy Spirit? Uh, imagine if everything we said to one another was controlled by love and guided by the Holy Spirit. Imagine if everything we said about one another was controlled by love and guided by the Holy Spirit. Unity depends on you. Unity depends on your mindset and unity depends on your actions. In verses 3 and 4, Paul gives a negative and then a positive instruction about our actions. Do not do this, do this instead. First, Paul says, do not act out of rivalry or to get attention. Many years ago, there were two dueling stage moms in the church that I served. Both of them had kids that had some talent and both of them were committed to making their kids into stars. And so they tried sneaky little ways to get their kids into the limelight. If an important speaker was visiting, one mom would call our pastor and ask if her kids could be on for worship that week so that they might be discovered. If a big holiday was coming up, the other mom would call the pastor and ask if her kids could be center stage. If someone on the worship team was still growing in their gifting and perhaps was not up at the a level of some of the others, uh, one of the moms would refuse to let her kids play because they didn't want that inferior musician to make her kid look bad. You know, the sad end result was that the kids from both families ended up walking away from worship and from the church. The, their mother's thirst for attention and rivalry pushed the kids away. Do not act out of rivalry or to get attention, but instead value others above yourself. Now, Paul doesn't mean that we adopt some kind of strange inferiority complex. He, he doesn't mean that, you know, we think, eh, I'm not worthy, I'm not, uh, you know, you're better than that. No, he doesn't mean that we put on some kind of weird false humility. Paul simply means that we act in such a way that puts the best interest of others first. Valuing others means that I take into consideration their needs and their vulnerabilities. Valuing others means that I act thoughtfully and carefully so that I promote and not prevent the spiritual growth of others. You know, one of those two stage moms had thought differently about their kids' giftings. Rather than reaching for stardom, what if they had seen their kids' potential to disciple other students with a desire to worship and to build something beautiful that honored the Lord? My home church in Philadelphia grew from a Friday night healing service into a mega church. But in the early days, there weren't a lot of resources. There weren't a lot of leaders or mature believers, just a bunch of new converts who were crazy about Jesus. Our pastor wanted to start a youth group, but we had no one to lead worship. So we sang Acapulco without accomplishment. 
one night our host, it was being held at a home, and one night our host, Anne, ran into her kitchen, and she came out with a, a bunch of brown paper lunch bags. And she brought a big jar full of pennies, and we put a scoop of pennies, a handful of pennies, into the brown paper lunch bags, and we tied them off, and we made homemade maracas. And we started singing our songs, Acapulco, without accomplishment, and shaking our homemade maracas. And we started strumming the brown paper bags like air guitars and blowing them with air and popping them in time. I will never forget the, the spontaneous, joyful worship that we had that night with our worship band made from brown paper lunch bags. We became a youth group that night. Anne was a housewife, she was a mother. She was a part-time hairdresser. She had no musical background whatsoever, no talent, but she went out and she bought a guitar and she taught herself how to play it. I remember the first night she ever stood in front of us, her knees were quaking together. I think she only played the first chord and the last chord of the song to see how off we were by the time we got to the, the end of the song. But she kept working at it and she got pretty good. And then one by one, she started teaching other students who wanted to learn, and most of them soared past Anne in no time. They started teaching other students and adults. The end result was that after just a couple of years, our church was overflowing with good musicians that were capable of leading worship and most importantly, of ushering people into the presence of the Lord. You know, many of them still, that was 40 years, 30-something years ago, you know, many of them still lead worship today. In fact, several dozen kids from our youth group grew to over 100 kids, and a couple dozen went into ministry over the years. Here's the point. Don't be like those two stage moms. Be like Anne. Make my joy complete, being like-minded controlled by love, guided by the Holy Spirit, be of one mind, do nothing out of rivalry or desire for attention, rather in humility, value others above yourself. A call to unity, three parts in Philippians 2, the basis of our unity, the basics of our unity. Finally, I find the benchmark of our unity, and that's Jesus. Paul says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The verses that follow are some of the most beautiful verses in the whole New Testament about Jesus. Pastor Nick is going to take them apart with you next week and it's going to be wonderful, but I simply want to close with this. The reason that we value others above ourselves is because that's precisely what Jesus did for us. Jesus didn't have to grasp that equality with God. He is God. But he humbled himself and came to earth as a man. He became a servant and he laid down his life on the cross to save us. He is our example. He is our model. He is our pattern to follow. We follow him laying down our lives to serve one another. A call to unity. The basis of our unity, it's our shared experience in Jesus. The basics of our unity, minds controlled by love, guided by the Spirit, and actions that put others first, and the benchmark of our unity, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus a great big praise in this place today?